Hi everybody, welcome to the fourth lesson for Legal Studies 3.4. In today's video, we're going to be covering the principles of justice, the burden standard of proof, factors to consider before initiating claim, BCAP and CAV. <clears throat> to start off with, this is a good refresher of the principles of justice. You would have gone over these in the third unit, in unit three, area study one, um, but these do continue to be used throughout area study two as well. Um, so just to make sure that you're familiar with them. Fairness is imp about impartial and just treatment without favoritism due to court processes. So this is ensuring that the plaintiff and defendant are treated in the same way and that defendants between different cases are treated in the same way. Um, and so this is things that the court can do, such as rules of evidence and procedure, having an impartial judge, pre-trial procedures, which ensure that neither party is at a disadvantage um, due to the way that they're treated. Equality is more about um, parties being treated the same due to their personal characteristics and attributes, so eliminating bias and prejudice from the case. An impartial judge also upholds this, so do interpreters and VCAT and CAV, which um, ensure that people of low socioeconomic status are not disadvantaged. And finally, access is the opportunity to understand your legal rights and pursue a case through legal institutions. Um, so access is upheld through anything which reduces costs and time involved in pursuing a civil trial. So as you'll learn throughout this area of study, things such as VCAT, CAV and additional dispute resolution. To start off with, um, we need to go through some of the introductory points of civil law. Um, so you would have learnt the burden standard of proof for criminal law. However, the um, burden standard of proof is slightly different for civil. So whilst the burden of proof is still the responsibility of the party initiating the claim, the claim to prove the claims made, um, because in civil law, it's the plaintiff initiating the claim, not the prosecution, the burden of proof lies with the plaintiff. Furthermore, whilst the standard of proof is still the quality of the evidence that's needed to discharge the burden and standard of proof, um, for civil, this is on the balance of probabilities. So which party is more likely to be correct? Um, and this is a much um, less strict threshold than criminal law, just because the um, consequences aren't as um, severe as in criminal law. Um, so as we've kind of already mentioned, the plaintiff is the party who initiates the civil claim, whereas the defendant is the party who is alleged to have infringed the rights of the plaintiff or caused the civil wrong. So now the first point of content is representative proceedings. So representative proceedings are groups of seven or more people who have similar claims against the same defendant. And so rather than having seven separate claims heard in court, they join their claims together as one. And that's commenced by the lead plaintiff who the case runs under their name. Um, the main benefit of a representative proceeding is that it shares the costs throughout the seven or more plaintiffs. So it improves access and equality because individuals who may not have otherwise been able to afford initiating a civil trial are able to do so. Also, it saves court resources because rather than having seven different judges um, allocated to seven different trials, it's heard all under one. So that reduces the court backlog significantly. Um, also, another strength of representative proceedings is that often litigation funders will actually bear all costs involved in exchange for a portion of the settlement. And so that improves access as well because often the, the plaintiffs don't actually have to pay any costs up front. However, the issues, the legal issues involved in representative proceedings are often quite complex. And so that means that the legal fees are often very, very high. Um, and that means that often by the time the legal fees are paid out um, and the remaining settlement is divided between the seven or more plaintiffs, the amount that each plaintiff receives may not actually be proportionate to the loss that they've suffered. Um, there's also arguments that representative proceedings do not uphold fairness because it's seven plaintiffs against one defendant. And so it's not, um, fair in the eyes of the law. Next, we move on to factors to consider before initiating a civil claim. So these are all things that prior to the plaintiffs um, lodging their statement of claim and issuing proceedings against the defendant, these are all things that the plaintiff should consider 
in order to determine whether it's actually worthwhile for them to pursue a claim. The first one to consider is negotiations. So this is considering whether the um, issue would be better resolved through informal discussions and um, compromises between the parties. This is because negotiations are cheaper and a lot more informal. Um, and it's a lot better in situations where parties want to maintain um, good relationships. So if it's a dispute with a neighbour or a family member, then mediation may be, um, and negotiation would be um, very suitable. Uh, the next factor to consider is whether the costs that are likely to be incurred at trial actually outweigh the um, amount the plaintiff is seeking. So if the plaintiff add up, adds up all the costs that they're likely to incur, and it's $200,000, but they're only seeking $100,000, then they shouldn't continue with that claim because it's not worthwhile. Um, and in doing so, the plaintiff should consider the cost of legal representation, jury fees for civil law. Um, it's not a right of either party to have trial by jury. If um, in order to have a jury, one party must request it. The party who does request it is required to pay for the jury fees. Um, another thing to consider is expert evidence fees. So if the um, parties want to um, obtain a medical expert or a um, scientific expert or a psychologist, they need to pay them um, for their evidence and testimonies. Um, disbursements or your out-of-pocket fees, so like court filing fees, um, the, doc the fees associated with um, entering documents into the court. And finally, also considering adverse cost orders. So um, the unsuccessful party will be required to pay for the successful party's fees. Um, and so if the party doesn't believe, if the plaintiff doesn't believe that they have a super solid case, then that would be a massive risk because they may not only be required to pay for their own legal fees, but also the other party if they are unsuccessful in court. Next, the plaintiff should consider the limitation of actions. So they should consider how much time has passed since the alleged wrongdoing. Um, this is because if they are too, if it's been too long since the um, civil wrong, the defendant can raise the defence that the plaintiff is out of time and that causes the um, claim to be over. Um, so any cost that the plaintiff has incurred prior to that would be a complete waste of money. Um, the limitations of actions for contract law is six years, whilst for defamation it is one year. So, um, you know, if you're outside of that time frame, then the defendant can get out of all um, allegations against them. So that's definitely something to consider. The next thing is the scope of liability. So who is the defendant? Um, and that's considering whether somebody else is more appropriately to be sued. Um, so for example, would it be more appropriate to sue their employer or an insurance company? Um, and also, was there anybody else involved through accessorial liability? Um, and the other part of this question is asking, to what extent is the defendant actually liable? Um, and asking whether there's any possibility that the defendant could raise the defense of contributory negligence which argues that the plaintiff is partially liable for the loss that they've suffered, and that reduces the amount of money that the plaintiff will receive. Um, so if the um, plaintiff was injured jumping out of a plane, skydiving, the defendant, the skydiving company could argue potentially that the plaintiff understood the risks that they were undertaking, and therefore they're partially liable for any injuries that they've faced. Um, and that would mean that they maybe only receive half the amount of my, uh, damages and money that they were intended to seek. Then the final issue to consider is enforcement issues. So even if the plaintiff is successful in court and is awarded damages, what is the actual chance of the defendant paying the money? So if the defendant is unlikely to be able to pay, then the plaintiff will need to go back to court, spend more time and money, um, and obtain an order such as attachment of earnings, attachment of debt, and warrant and seizure of sale. Attachment of earnings is where the um, plaintiff receives a portion of the defendant's pay from their employer. Um, attachment of debt is where a third party who owes money to the defendant pays that to the plaintiff. And warrant and seizure of sale is where the defendant's assets are seized and sold and the money is recovered by the plaintiff. Um, so when considering if there's going to be any issues with enforcement, um, it should be considered whether the defendant has significant assets, whether they're bankrupt, 
whether they're overseas because this may mean it's harder to obtain the money. Um, and so yeah, they're the five factors to consider. Next, we move on to CAV. So CAV is Consumer Affairs Victoria, which seeks to enforce compliance with consumer laws in Victoria. It's a cost-free dispute resolution body, and it only accepts complaints from consumers and tenants, not businesses or landlords. So it intends to protect the weaker individual in these types of disputes. Um, it's accessible to all Victorians. So even if you have a very high income, you're still eligible for CAV. Um, CAV is beneficial because it's, all in, it's very informal. It's all over the phone, which makes it also even more accessible. Um, through the dispute resolution processes, CAV uses conciliation, which is where the third party will provide suggestions to parties, but ultimately the final decision is reached by the parties, which means that they're more likely to accept it. However, CAV has a very limited jurisdiction um, in the sense that it only hears complaints from consumers and tenants, um, and it has no enforcement mechanism. So if a defendant refuses to attend a conciliation over the phone, there's nothing they can do about it. Um, another issue with CAV is that even if the parties reach an agreement through conciliation, that decision will not be binding and CAV cannot enforce that and make the defendant um, fulfill their promises. CAV upholds the principles of justice because it is specialised in consumer affairs, meaning that the um, third parties and conciliators are very experienced and um, aware of consumer laws, leading to more appropriate decisions and more efficient allocation of resources. CAV upholds equality because it only takes claims from the weaker individual, um, usually those who would have less financial means, um, so the tenant or the consumer, and that ensures that they're not disadvantaged because of their um, lesser financial capacity. CAV upholds access because it's over the phone um, and they use conciliation, which is cheap and very quick. Um, and it also upholds access because parties reach an agreement themselves. So they're more likely to um, be, be uh, comfortable and accept that decision. However, um, fairness is undermined because of the fact that CAV still does prioritise some cases. They do have um, reasonably limited um, resources, so they have to prioritise cases based on um, you know, the types of issues and the circumstances of the parties. Fairness, um, equality is undermined due to the limited jurisdiction um, in the sense that it doesn't take claims from the um, landlord and business, um, even if they wouldn't be able to um, afford a case in court. And access is undermined because CAV has no ability to force parties to attend and enforce a decision made by parties. So it can actually waste time. If you go through all of the processes at CAV, reach a decision, um, and then the defendant refuses to pay, then you have to go back through the, that process in court or at VCAT. Moving on to VCAT. VCAT is Victoria's Civil and Administrative Tribunal, which provides low cost, accessible and independent tribunal services. Um, so VCAT has a president who is a Supreme Court judge and vice presidents who are county court judges and members and senior members. So it's not staffed by judges and magistrates, it's um, presidents, vice presidents, members and senior members. VCAT has four lists, the administrative, which Here's um, council disputes, civil, which is um, most of the kind of disputes, um, consumer contracts, that kind of thing, human rights, which is discrimination cases, residential tenancy, which is um, tenant and landlord disputes, but those claims can be brought from both the tenant and the landlord, unlike CAP. So those four lists ensure that VCAT is very specialised within each list. VCAT is um, a low cost, um, dispute resolution body um, as 80% of parties are self-represented and often um, they will um, ask parties to be self-represented in order to um, even out the playing field and ensure that a self-represented party is not disadvantaged. Um, there's also a lot less delays than in courts. The medium wait time is about 10 weeks. Um, so VCAT uses a range of dispute resolution bodies and services 
First, um, parties will either attend a mediation or compulsory conference, which is a form of conciliation. Um, if that doesn't succeed, then there, there is a final hearing, which is a form of arbitration, um, where the um, member or senior member, president or vice president, will listen to both sides of the dispute and make a binding decision. However, that final hearing is a lot less formal than court. For civil claims of less than $3,000, so usually like if you, know, you buy a faulty product or something and you, uh, the, the company refuses a warranty, then there is a short mediation hearing, SMAR, and that's where if the mediation is unsuccessful at that same day, you will go to final hearing and the um, member, senior member, vice president or president will resolve that um, on the same day to reduce delays for those very um, minor disputes. Um, VCAT has quite limited avenues for appeal. You can only appeal on a point of law. So that's the way that the um, member president applies the law to the facts of the um, dispute. Not, you cannot dispute the amount of damages or the um, decision that's imposed. If it's a um, appeal from the president, then it's heard in the Supreme Court Court of Appeal or if it's a vice president, it's heard in the Supreme Court Trial Division. VCAT is um, a much cheaper, quicker and informal um, dispute resolution body in comparison to courts, which improves its ability to uphold the, act, the principles of access and equality. Um, VCAT also upholds fairness because it is far more specialised than um, other dispute bodies through its four lists. Um, it also is beneficial because it allows parties to reach an agreement themselves prior to that final hearing through either mediation or compulsory conference conciliation. However, VCAT um, fees and delays are increasing, not to the same extent as courts, but it is more expensive than what it once was. So that limits its ability to achieve access. VCAT also does have some restrictions on the type of cases it hears. So it doesn't hear any complex cases such as representative proceedings. And as we said before, there's a very limited right to appeal. However, um, furthermore, VCAT also doesn't follow the doctrine of precedence. So VCAT members are not bound by the prior decisions of other VCAT members, which may mean that there's inconsistency between the trials and cases. VCAT, as we said before, upholds fairness because the members within each four lists are highly specialised, leading to more um, appropriate dispute resolution um, decisions. Equality is achieved because it's a lot cheaper um, and parties are usually self-represented, which ensures that a party with a lower financial capacity is not disadvantaged. Um, as we said before, it's a lot quicker and a lot cheaper upholding access and also parties are able to reach an agreement themselves, which they may be more comfortable with and willing to accept, therefore um, upholding access. However, uh, fairness is undermined because of the lack of precedent and the lack of consistency between cases. Um, and equality is undermined due to the increasing costs and delays, especially in some lists such as the environmental and planning lists. And finally, access is undermined due to the lack of appeals um, on, a, da on damages and decisions. So that brings us to the end of that video. In the next video, we're going to be covering pre-trial procedures, the court hierarchy and court personnel. Hope to see you there.